Well, welcome, everybody, whether you're Wexford, whether you're at Dormont, East End, Oakland, Sewickley Valley, we are thrilled that you're here, and particularly if you're one of our campuses for the first time this weekend, welcome. Thrilled that you are here, um, and anything that we can do to come along inside and serve you, please let us know. Did you catch the last phrase of that video? She said, nothing to lose, everything to gain. I'm actually going to close today's message with that same exact phrase. And if you recall, I set up this series, The Ripple Effect, back in, a, in our sort of our whole fall teaching a, a few weeks back in a sermon. And I told you that often what we do is the week after Labor Day, it's sort of the fall sort of church launch season. In the past, what we would typically do is, is a series like an invite your friend series, right? Something that would be intriguing for all of us, but would also clearly be for, um, for those that maybe don't go to church anywhere. It would be an opportunity for you to invite your friend. Two years back, we did a series in that spot called My Own Worst Enemy, right? We just talked about these things, the way that we fail. Um, at times, the way we mess up our lives. Uh, last year, we actually spent a short series when we kicked off in the fall on end, the end times. And this year, we decided to do something a little differently. We decided to spend the month of, of September addressing a really simple question. Who is Jesus? And, and during our time together today, I'm going to ask you to identify where you are in regards to answering that question. And I'm going to just sort of state this right up front. At the end of, of this sermon, I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge all of us to consider to take a step forward in faith, maybe even a faith risk. You, you know, I don't know about you, but I've noticed on TV recently this onslaught of these survival in the wilderness shows. Have you guys seen any of these, right? It feels like we've turned roughing it alone in the wilderness into some kind of superpower. It's almost like if you can do that, it's like you can fly or, or, or disappear, right? These crazy shows about roughing it out there in, in the wilderness. In, in one of these survival shows, our, our host, it says he encounters a wolf. Or if you were a Pittsburgher, you would say he encountered a wolf, right? And, and, the, and, the, and the wolf, it, it, it turns and runs away, he says. And, and I'm thinking to myself, well, of course he ran away because there's probably like 15-person film crew slogging through the woods like with this lone survivor guy, right? But the survival hero, he goes on to, to say this, that if you see a wolf in the wilderness and it runs away, it means that it's alone and that it won't harm you. It's known as a lone wolf, right? However, he went on to explain if it stops and faces off with you, then you better start running. Why? Be because it's not alone. And there's more wolves uh, approaching. Um, basically, they could be even surrounding you right there. A pack of wolves in the wilderness is powerful. But a lone wolf, it, it goes from hunter to scavenger. A lone wolf it will eat garbage. It it'll eat scraps of, of, of a leftover carcass just to survive. 2,000 years ago, the remnant of God's people were living in a wilderness survival show. At this point in history, it happened to be the Romans that had them crushed. But before that, it may have been the Philistines or the, the Babylonians that had defeated the nation of Israel, had dispersed them or enslaved them. And instead of a living life to the full that God so desired, they were slaves that they were scavengers. And at this particular time in history, in the wilderness, only the strong survived. Evil ran wild. Oppression abounded. Women were treated as if they were property. Children were discarded like trash. People looked out only for their own kind. And you were as only as strong as your pack. And then, something really familiar to, to, I bet all of us in the room happened. And it's found in Luke 2, verse 1. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And, and this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered and each to his own hometown. And Joseph, right, also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was from the house and the lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothing, right? And laid him in a manger. 
because there was no place for them in the inn. It almost seems sort of weird to, to read that scripture in September, doesn't it? Right? You know, for a moment though with me, try not to think when, when, I, when you hear that verse, or when you just heard me read that, try, try not to think of the baby in the manger. Try not to think of silent night or Christmas time. Rather, know that this is when and how God chose to enter the survival show and find us. See, he, he came to find his people, the, 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 the remnant of, of the nation of Israel, but he also came to fulfill an ancient promise that goes all the way back to Abraham, that he had indeed come for all people. He slipped into the world that night for the oppressed as well as the oppressors. And it may have been a silent sort of night in Bethlehem that night just for a moment. But I want to assure you of something. The world was anything but all is calm and all is bright. At this point in history, when Jesus was born, the world was dark and it raged against God. And about 30 or so years later, this baby... Now a man, Jesus, decided to go public with who he was and and, and why he came. And he called this band of ragtag sort of scavengers, a couple brothers and a few lone wolves to to follow him. And for the next three years, it says, that, that that's exactly what they did. And it ended those three years, roughly, with his gruesome death on a cross that's widely acknowledged by biblical as well as historical writings. And then about... I think maybe 20 or 30 so years later, Jesus' life began to be documented and recorded by those that were closest to him, by those that were eyewitnesses. See, this belief in a baby in a manger, it, it moved to this miracle worker, to this incredible teacher, death on a cross, resurrection, God, man. And, and, and his This story is spread. It's spreading all over the region. And Peter, he's part of Jesus' sort of inner circles, one of those early eyewitness believers. It says this in 1 Peter chapter 2. This is what he says about the believers of this time. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people from his own possession, that, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness, called you out of the wilderness and into the marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you did not receive mercy, but now you have received mercy. Peter goes on in this text to tell us that we were once exiles and sojourners out in the wilderness, all alone. But now he says you're chosen and you're royal and you're holy. God's grace and mercy is available to all who believe. And right around that same time, th- this, sort of re- this is, is recorded from once a Christian killer, now a lead missionary, the Apostle Paul. He says this about the believers, and this is going to change everything. He says in Galatians 3, 25, But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, so under the law. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many as you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now here's the important part. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs, according to the promise. Because of Jesus' life, everything has changed. The dividing line is, is gone. It, Jesus does not now, it doesn't matter where, where, you've, where you're from, it doesn't matter the color of your skin, your, your gender, or, or anything to do with the life that you've lived. Jesus says none of that matters now. We can all be one family, one pack. You might have been a person, but now Jesus is inviting you to be part of a people. No need to remain in the wilderness as a survivalist or, or, or a lone Wolf, believe in me, he says, and you will become a son or a daughter of the Most High God. And whether or not you you, you believe in Jesus as the Son of God, you've got to admit 
There has never been anyone that has influenced mankind like him ever, period. On the day after Jesus' death, it looked like whatever small mark that he had left on the earth was going to quickly disappear, right? His, his followers, the, the closest ones, they scattered. They, they, they were hiding. It seemed to everyone that his movement had failed. However, just 20 or 30 years later, as I, as I read there, those ragtag group of disciples were turning the world upside down. And shockingly, 2,000 or so years later now, right, his impact on the earth is like no other person that, that has ever lived. His ripple effect from his life is unparalleled from any other person that's ever walked this earth. You know, our, our, our calendars are based on his life. You can look at any map, right? And, and you're going to see, you know, territories and cities and roads named after him or his early followers. I read this quote earlier in a sermon. I want to read it again here. That Pastor John Ortberg, author, pastor, he says this. We name our children after his disciples and early followers, Matthew and Mary and John. And we name our dogs and pizza shops after the rulers of his day. He goes on to say that his teaching fueled the civil rights movements, formed the basis for separation of church and state, elevated the status of women, led to the development of hospitals, and inspired the foundations of the world's top universities. All this from a man who never held public office, led an army, discovered a new land, or amassed a great fortune. Now stay with me. I want to drive this just a little bit further with you. At the time of Jesus' birth, women had virtually no worth or value. They were viewed as property. Do you know the longest recorded conversation between Jesus and any other person in the Bible is with a woman, the woman at the well. And Jesus accepts her, and he treats her like she has her own identity. And folks, I know this is hard to grab, but you have to know this. That would have been unheard of from any other Jewish teacher to even have a conversation with a woman, let alone it would have been unimaginable to treat her with any kind of dignity. Another thing that was unheard of at this time and again, we just, this is so long ago and it's so different now, but you have to understand, Jesus, he was the first person, he offered women Christian community. He offered them community. And it's just, in Luke 8, it refers to these specific women that they were traveling with Jesus and his disciples. This would have been shocking at the time. Borderline scandalous. See, Jesus reached out a hand to women to validate them, to affirm that they had worth in, in God's eyes. And, and I believe that, that, that that had an impact on the way that women are treated currently today, that that ripple effect started back then with Jesus and, and his early followers. I, I believe that. Did you know that the earliest hospital was created by Christians for a group of people with leprosy? Did you know that around... 165 A.D., smallpox epidemic broke out, nearly killing a quarter of the region's population. And its peak, 5,000 people a day were dying from this. And they found this script of this, this Greek historian who wrote about the Christians' actions during the plague. And it says this, he said, Heedless of the danger, they took charge of the sick, attended to the needs, and ministering to them in Christ. And with them departed this life serenely, drawing on themselves the sickness and cheerfully accepting their pains. In, in this book that, that John Ortberg wrote, I recommend it, it's, I put it in your notes, it's called Who Is This Man? In addition to, to value of women, to, to valuing children, to, to taking care of the sick, Ortberg traces back the origins of things like prison reform and the establishment of orphanages plus all these other epic, life-changing institutions and systems, all the way back to the time of Jesus and his early followers. There is simply no denying the impact of, of, of this man globally. It's unparalleled. It's unheard of. So let me ask you a question. Who is this man? Do you believe Jesus to be simply an influential human being? Or do you believe he is who he said he was, the Son of God? You know, generally speaking, I would think that across all of our campuses today, that there might be three broad sort of groupings uh, of people with us here today. So, so one would be this. There would be a group of you that are unsure. 
Are you just unsure? I mean, you range from, you know, I'm, I don't know. I'm trying to figure this out, or maybe all the way up to the point where you're saying, no, I just, I really don't believe that there is a, is a God. Regardless to where you're at in this grouping, you, you currently do not believe or trust God. Now, now, secondly, there's another group out there, and I'll just call this group believers, right? A conversation with somebody in this group might go something like this. Well, do you believe in God? And it's, sure. Are, are you a Christian? Well, I suppose because I'm, I'm not anything else. I mean, I believe in God. I go to church when I can. Or the conversation might go something like this when they say, well, I'm a Presbyterian. Or, or I'm a Catholic. So absolutely I believe in God. And I try real hard to, to, to be a good person. I mean, I'm not a religious weirdo that gets all serious and crazy about, you know, God and stuff like that. But I believe. And I would say that this group is very prevalent in Western PA. Because so many of us, right, we, we just, we grew up going to church and, and believing. See, I believe that this group believes. But my question to this group, do you trust God? Because, see, I think there's a big difference between believing and trusting. And then there's a third group of, of folks th th that are here today. And I, maybe I'd call you followers or, or the word disciple of Jesus. Their response, you know, is not, well, I'm sort of, you know, I don't know. They're not attempting to, to they, what they are, they are attempting to follow the character, ways, and mission of God. They're not trying to just believe and blend in, be undercover. No, they're, they're really comfortable with being known and identified as a Christ follower. Now, clearly, there's a small minority of this grouping that, that at times is just way too over the top. In fact, at times, they do more harm for Christianity than good. But I think that's a really a small minority. I think this group mostly lives life humbly, you know, submitted, graciously. That They're committed to trying to represent Jesus well. This group, to sum it up, I would say they believe, but they also fully trust God. So where are you? Unsure, believer, or disciple? Well, if you're here today and you would have placed yourself in that unsure group, then I'm going to assume that you're at least interested or curious as to who Jesus is. So I want to say a couple things just to anybody that's in that group that's with us today. One, we are thrilled that you are here. Regardless of where you're at in your faith, we are thrilled you are here. You are welcome at Northway, period. And secondly, this, over the next three weeks, we're going to really dig into who Jesus is, his character, his ways, his mission. So if you're unsure and you keep coming back, at least at the end of this series, you're going to have a pretty good idea of who this Jesus is. And then the third one is this. Over the next several minutes, I'm actually going to be challenging the other two groups rather directly. So if you came today and you're unsure, but you were brought here by a believer or a disciple, you, you can elbow them on the way home and just say, man, you know, what are you going to do with what old Pastor Scott said up there today, right? So you can actually work with me today. You got me? Help me. Help me out. So if you're in the believer group or the disciple group, I want to talk to you about trust for a few minutes. Any healthy relationship, it's rooted in trust, right? It's no different with God. Here's a couple statements, if, and these are in your notes. If you ever wonder what God wants for you, it's for you to move from a person to a people. If you ever wonder what God wants from you, he wants your trust. If God wants anything from you, it's to hear you say, I trust you, God. I trust you fully. So, so if you zoned out, zone back in with me because I want to go through something. I'm going to be doing a little Hebrew up here and all this stuff. So come on, just get back up here. Get, get, look, get, get, get focused. Exodus 24. This is Moses, and he's speaking to the people. And it says this in Exodus 24, verse 7. Then he, this is Moses, took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. So the people hear God's plan for them and they all say, yes, we, we will do this. And, and yes, we will obey. And at a quick glance, doesn't that response, just leave that up there. It, doesn't that response even seem a bit repetitive, right? Maybe even redundant. I'm going to do, and I'm going to obey. It's like answering a question with yes and yes, right? See, see when I studied this, though, 
Here is something that I think the English language actually breaks down a little bit. In the Hebrew language, there is something crucial in here for us to sort of discover about this repetitiveness. See, the word do and obey or obedience are two different words in the Hebrew language. So, so the word do is this word asa, and in Hebrew it means to act or to do, right? It's like this, in the military, if you're told to do something, you just do it. That's asa. If you show up at work and your boss gives you three things to do that day and you do them, that's asa, right? It's, it's doing. The Hebrew word for obey here, though, is a completely different word, and it's the word shema, and it means to hear and to understand. So catch this, a subtle yet profound aspect of this text. The order is not an accident. The people are saying, we will say yes, and in the process of doing, of following God, we will understand. As I am doing and imitating God's character and ways and mission, then it will begin to make sense and I will understand it as I do. Now stay with me, because see, I think we want to flip this. We say to God, I, I need to understand a lot more stuff here before I start to do any of it. We, we go to this space, you know, I'm going to need to fully understand all of it first, and then I will act. Then I will do. Then I will obey. And that is not the way it works with God. See, God is saying our relationship has got to be built on trust. It starts with a yes and doing. And I will give you understanding as we do this together. Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with, your, with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. God is saying, trust me first and I will give you clarity and understanding as we travel. If you're a 16-year-old and you, you want to learn how to drive, or if you have a 16-year-old and you want someone to teach them, you want somebody that's actually driven a car, right? You want someone that, that just doesn't understand how to drive a car to teach you. Same thing with raising a kid, right? You can read all those, you know, raising babies for dummies books that you want, but until you've raised a kid, you don't fully understand what it means, you don't understand skydiving until you jump out of a plane. You don't understand boxing until you stepped in the ring and got punched in the face. Doing comes before understanding. It is true in every arena of our life, but we want to flip it when it comes to our relationship with God. We say, God, I'm, I'm going to wait till I understand everything, and then you know, I'll start doing. I want to know all the costs first. You know, God, I, I, there's a couple little things I just don't have quite figured out. There seems to be a lot of different views on them. I want to figure that out be, before I start doing. In fact, I want to know the outcome before I start doing. Folks, God is saying to you, no, I am sorry. You have to trust me first. It starts with a yes, and the understanding will come. Spiritual maturity is not someone that has a lot of knowledge about God with a sash full of Sunday school badges or a wall full of Christian books. That is not spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity is a person that trusts God and does what he says. I read a story about a man who had an encounter with Mother Teresa. And, and, and she comes up to him and literally asks him, what can I pray for you about? I mean, jackpot, right? If Mother Teresa would come up to you and ask for you to, to pray for you, she's going to pray for you, then come up with something good. Because she's got like a pipeline. And this guy says this. He says, my life is so complicated. Will you pray for me, Mother Teresa, to have clarity? And I love her response. She says this. In, in my life, I have never had clarity. However, I have always had trust. So instead of clarity, I will pray that you will trust God. In our lives, we want to eliminate the need to trust God by making sure that we understand everything first. And what crazy idea. But what if we were just to assume that God was right and just start following him and knowing that the understanding will come? What was Jesus's first words? 
I mean, probably mama or dada, right? I mean, right? Okay. Some of you will catch up with that one. But after, after Jesus' death and resurrection, we know what his final words were here on earth. They're recorded in, in, in Matthew 28, 18. It says this, and Jesus came and said to them, here's his final words, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you and behold, or, or trust me, he says here, I will be with you always till the end of the age. Folks, this is God's plan A. And there is no plan B. This is called the Great Commission. And too often, I think Christians view it as merely a suggestion. So, so here comes the part that I told you that I was going to be quite direct with some of the believers and disciples in this room. Those of you that are believers need to become disciples. And those of you that are disciples need to become disciple makers. And I'm going to be blunt here. And this is where I'll get the emails. Scott S. at Northway.org. I go on vacation this week, so I'll get back to you in a week or two. But I'm going to be blunt. The last thing some of you need is another good Christian book or another Christian concert or a men or women's retreat, or a class on revelations. You need to get discipled or disciple someone. I don't want to push a little further. If that didn't get you. The last thing some of us, you need, is endless hours in front of TV watching Fox News or CNN. And we sit there and we are pounded with political pundits' views on everything from Iraq to Israel to Ferguson, Missouri. And people come up to me and say, the world has gone crazy and the church isn't doing enough. And I say, you know, we're praying, but I want to submit something to you. That the only thing that has changed about wilderness survival since Jesus' time is our awareness. Because folks... Folks, brokenness has always been rampant in this world since Adam did nothing to stop Eve from taking a bite of that apple. My hope is anchored in one truth, that the gospel of Jesus Christ can penetrate any mess of this world. Governments and systems and institutions are part of what God does, but only the gospel changes heart. And I refuse to lose hope because in what? Now, don't, thank you for that. See, I refuse to lose hope by what appears to be the madness of the world because I know that we win. And I wonder how different this world would be if Christians for the last 2,000 years would have followed Jesus' plan. I wonder how different people would view Christianity if we would have just followed his plan A. I wonder how different our church and our city could be if in the next few years we would just follow Jesus' plan. The world has always been broken. The only thing different now is it's our turn. So what should we do? Do what Jesus said in his final statement. Believers, man, get discipled. And those of you that are our disciples, make disciple makers. It's, it's our turn. And what I am not saying here is, please hear me on this, that there's something wrong with Christian books or Bible studies or being informed of the happenings of the world. But what I am saying is Jesus' last words were not go and make Republicans or Democrats or go and make followers of a particular gifted teacher or author. His last words were go and make disciples. And it was not a suggestion. I'm going to push you a little bit further. Everyone, wherever you're at, pull out this little card that's in your notes, okay? This little insert will be in the, the, the notes for all five weeks, or all four, four weeks of this sermon series. And we're going to continue to bring it up to you. So we have five challenges listed that I'm asking all of you to consider taking one of these challenges. So the first one is this. Go through our prepare sort of website, web um, curriculum with, with a friend. This is a, found, a four-week foundational 
sort of discipleship material. Get a friend and go through it together. Maybe do it as a family. All the instructions are on the website. It's all listed on there. All right, and then maybe you're saying, oh, I just don't know who I'd want to go through that with or I don't really have anybody to go through that with. All right, each of our campuses, we're going to run a prepare class. So you can do the work on the web and then come to the class and participate together. And your campus pastor will let you know the times at your particular campus. The third thing on there is go through the discipleship journey or discipleship essentials with a friend. These are two formational discipleship curriculums that we've chosen. And these are not four weeks. I'm just saying it right out front. These are something that would take you 20 or 30 weeks to walk through with someone. Find someone and take a few friends. Commit to going through one of these two tools together. You know, I've taken, I took a group of guys through Discipleship Journey a year or two ago. And I've never taken anybody or I've never done the Discipleship Essential tool. And, and about a month or so ago, I just asked my daughter, Aaron, 20 years old, honey, what do you think? You want to do this? I'll get the book. We'll go through this together. You do the work on your own. I'll do the work on my own. That's the way it works. And then when we come together for an hour or so and we talk about what we learned, best four or five one-hour conversations I've had with my daughter up to this point in a long time, opportunity to sit and talk about God, you do this with someone. If you've got a teenager, ask them to do it with you. So important. And some of you are saying, man, I just don't know that I can lead something like that. Scott, you're a pastor. I mean, okay. The fourth one is this then. Attend a Making Disciple Makers Lab on your campus. Again, there will be these labs at all of our campuses. It's four weeks long. And we're going to basically teach you how to use the four, these, these tools. You'll actually take a piece of this home. You'll do it on your own. You'll come back to the lab, and there'll be a, like, almost like a simulation of how it can go, answer questions. You'll come back the next week. You'll get another tool, and, and you'll go through that one. And then the fifth thing on here is that our friend Dave Buring um, will be in, in in the fall to, to, to do a one-day Jesus Blueprint seminar, which is all about making disciple makers. I introduced this to all of us today across all of our campus. Will you please consider one of these challenges. Take these home and begin to pray about it. I believe there are many of you, many of us here today, that we've received the story of God, but you've never given it away. And you might think that receiving the story of Jesus is what changes you, but I am convinced that giving the story to someone else is what will change you forever. We were never designed to be wilderness survivalists or lone wolves. And in, in that video that we watched prior to the sermon, right, did you hear some of the things the women said? One of them said, I was floundering in my faith, but discipleship was the difference maker. One of them said, I was intimidated even by the word disciple. But now, just, I, I get it, right? And lastly, they said, there is nothing to lose and everything to gain. And I told you I would circle back and land there. If a ragtag band of disciples got this and did it 2,000 years ago, resulting in ripple effects of unbelievable proportions, what could happen if 5,000 people that call Northway home across five different locations around the city were to do the same. I think it could cause some ripple effects in this city that would be felt for generations to come. I want to ask you to stand up with me across all of our campuses and at the other locations I'm going to have your campus leader or campus pastor come up and, and pray for you.